Welcome to part seven of the Second World War. Now we are going to talk about the rising sun, Japan. Throughout Japanese history, there has always been an emperor, but the emperor has not always been the person in power, right? Now, from about 1603 forward, um, the uh, Japan was actually ruled by a shogunate called the Tokugawa. The Tokugawa shogunate. Um, to, uh, shogun literally means great generals. Okay. Um, the Tokugawa shogunate was established by Tokugawa Ieyasu. Okay. His son Iemitsu is actually going to open up a policy in Japan called uh, uh, Saka, uh, Sakoku, which is going to be isolationism. Right. He's going to oust all Europeans, the Portuguese specifically, in their trade port of Nagasaki. Now, the only European contact with Japan after this is going to be a very small trade ligation in Nagasaki operated by the Dutch. And the reason why the Dutch were allowed to stay there is they'd helped expel out the Portuguese and the Jesuits as well, right? So you have isolationism amongst the Tokugawa in its own, nearly its strictest sense until July 8, 1853. On July 8, 1853, U.S. Commodore Matthew Perry showed up with the United States Navy and he spoke to the Tokugawa shogunate, at this point uh, led by Tokugawa Ieyoshi. And he told him, said, I want to open up trade between Japan and the United States. And in fact, here's a nice piece of white linen to show you some of the United States wares. I will be back in one year. <clears throat> After one year, you can open trade for us, or you can use that piece of linen to surrender to us. So he actually had the, uh, the cojones, if you will, to present Japan, the Tokugawa, with their own surrender flag, right? A year later, he returns. Tokugawa Iesada, the son of Iyoshi, uh, Iyoshi had died, uh, is going to open up trade with the United States and eventually Europe in general. The influx of technology and material and things is going to cause a destabilization of the Tokugawa and the reassumption of power of the emperor. By 1868, the Tokugawa shogunate collapsed and the emperor will resume as the center of power in Japan. It's known as the Meiji Restoration. The reason why is that the emperor at this time was uh, Meiji Tenno, who was, you know, was his name, so they called it the Meiji Restoration. In 1868, uh, Meiji uh, Tenno is going to issue the Charter Oath of the Five Principles, which is going to be a modernization program in Japan, right? They're going to end the feudal system. They're going to adopt a new school system that's based on the Western model. And by 1889, they are actually even going to establish a Meiji constitution, which is going to create a constitutional monarchy in Japan. Now, this constitutional monarchy is similar to uh, the British parliamentary style, but there are some pretty key differences, right? Uh, but it does create a bicameral parliament. You have a upper house and a lower house, like what you have in Britain. You have the House of Lords and the House of Commons. The lower house is elected by the people, so there is some democracy here, right? The members of the lower house are elected directly by the people, but to be fair, suffrage is very limited. Only about 5% of Japanese citizens had the vote. Then you had the upper house, which was referred to as a diet. Now this was a little bit more complex. See here, the emperor himself appoints a prime minister. And that prime minister then creates a diet by grabbing ministers from each department. Each department will basically send a minister to form the diet, okay? Um, this is a little bit problematic because what happens is that, let's say uh, the army sends its minister and the army doesn't like the decisions being made by the prime minister. All they have to do to cause the government to collapse is withdraw their minister. They withdraw the, the army's minister, the government collapses, the emperor has to pick a new prime minister, and that new prime minister has to form a new diet. All right. So a power struggle is going to develop in Japan in the 1920s and into the 1930s between two groups of people, the militarists, the army especially, but the navy to a lesser degree, and the Zabatsu. Zabatsu were the industrialists, the large industrial families who had enough power that they actually had ministerships. Okay, um, This power struggle went back and forth, but really by the end of the 1920s, beginning of the 1930s, the militarists will have pretty much taken control 
of the japanese government